Okay. Hello, thank you everyone and welcome. This is Kelly Musoke and I'm the Director of Education at the Curry Center. Today we have over 750 participants registered for our webinar from across the United States. You should be able to see a participant list on your screen, though there are also many groups logged in. Today's session is being recorded and we plan to post these recordings on our website in the near future for your use. You have all been placed on mute in order to preserve the quality of the recording, and for this reason, we ask that you reserve all questions and comments for the question and answer period, which will take place after all of the presentations. This webinar is produced by the Curry International Tuberculosis Center located in Oakland, California. The Curry Center is one of five regional tuberculosis training and medical consultation centers in the country. The Curry Center covers jurisdictions in the Western region. This project was funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Cooperative Agreement and is a project of the University of California, San Francisco. This webinar is approved for a total of 1.5 continuing education contact hours for doctors and nurses. The center is accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education to provide continuing medical education for physicians. The center is also approved as a provider of continuing education by the California State Board of Registered Nurses, provider number CEP12308. In order to receive your continuing education contact hours, you must have registered for the webinar, participate in the entire training, and complete the online evaluation. The website for the evaluation was emailed this morning to all registered course participants. All of today's faculty members have signed a declaration of disclosure. Okay. We'd now like to get a sense of who has logged in, so please take a moment to respond to this polling slide. Okay, thank you. It looks like the majority of you are participating uh, as individuals and about 17% of you are logged in as small groups and a couple large groups as well. All right, thank you very much and welcome. You don't have to even right, use your here phone. comes the next polling slide. It's easier. Do you currently treat patients with LTBI, latent tuberculosis infection? Okay, great. It looks like the majority of you, about 74%, said yes. Thank you. And I have one more question for you. What are any barriers to treating TB infection in your practice? Okay, well, it looks like the large majority of you are saying limited resources to follow patients, uh, though there's a variety of other responses, and about 5% of you have said all of the above. Thank you. Okay. Well, now I'd like to introduce our faculty members for our training today. Uh, Barbara Cole is the Director of Disease Control for the County of Riverside Department of Public Health. She obtained her BSN PHN from UCLA and her MSN from Cal State. Barbara has over 30 years of public health experience with a focus on TB and other communicable diseases. She is the TB and CB controller for the County of Riverside Department of Public Health. She is the current chair of the CDC Advisory Committee for the Elimination of TB, member and past president of the California TB Controllers Association, and member and past president of the California Association of Communicable Disease Controllers. Barbara serves on the faculty for the Curry Center 
and as a guest lecturer for the Loma Linda School of Nursing. Dr. Louise McNitt first became interested in public health and disease control when she was doing research at the CDC on mosquito genetics for the purpose of controlling the spread of malaria. She went back to school to do a degree in medicine and a master's in public health. She has been working in TB control since 2008, first in San Bernardino County and now in Contra Costa County, California. And also Dr. Neha Shah is a field medical officer with the CDC assigned to the California Department of Public Health. Prior to coming to California, she was the TB controller in Chicago and did her EIS training with Global AIDS Project. She is part of the MDR consult service at the TB branch in California and is the point person for CHP. Okay, here is our agenda for our webinar today. These are the learning objectives. And at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Louise McNitt for the introduction. Thank you, Kelly. <clears throat> so today we are going to hear about who is at risk for latent TB infection and who should be screened, why targeted testing is recommended over universal screening, and what screening tests are available. We will also hear about the different treatment options for latent TB infection. So let's start with a little background. Active TB had been declining steadily in the U.S. throughout the 20th century, thanks to improved living conditions, the development of TB-specific antibiotics, and public health interventions. Because of these successes, many health departments began to dismantle much of the TB control in infrastructure, as TB was thought to be a thing of the past. Unfortunately, this meant we weren't prepared for a resurgence, a resurgence in TB cases in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Because TB control was no longer a priority, we weren't prepared for the increase in cases that came with the HIV AIDS epidemic and an increase in immigration from TB endemic countries. The resurgence in cases led to reinvestment in TB control activities and many health departments were able to rebuild robust TB control programs. The good news is that the number of TB cases has been declining since then, but there are still estimated to be 11 million people in the U.S. with latent TB infection. The WHO estimates that one in three people globally is infected with TB. Five to 10% of those infected with TB will go on to develop active disease during their lifetime. That's a lot of potential TB cases. Since the resurgence in cases in the 80s and 90s, TB diagnosis and treatment was considered primarily a public health responsibility. As rates of active disease have declined and budgets in many public health departments have tightened, Resources have been shifted away from TB control. In the six years I have been in TB control, I have worked in two different TB programs that have both had to deal with shrinking budgets and reductions in staff. This has led to the need to prioritize TB control activities. Continuing high priority activities like treating patients with active disease, but letting other things go. I have heard of similar trends in health departments all over the U.S. For example, many TB control programs used to offer LTBI treatment to anyone with positive tests for TB infection. Now most programs can only offer treatment to those at highest risk, like close contacts to active cases, the homeless, or people with HIV. Lower risk patients are referred to the community <coughs> providers for treatment. Implementation of the Affordable Care Act has accelerated this trend of TB care shifting from public health to providers in the community. Public health has traditionally been the safety net provider for, for people without health insurance. Now that more people have health insurance, they can go to their private provider instead of coming to the health department. In many ways, this is better for the patient. Patients who need it can be screened for TB as a regular part of their health maintenance by a provider that they know and trust. They don't need to go to a clinic and see a provider that they aren't familiar with. Local TB programs can partner with community providers to ensure that patients get appropriate LTBI screening and treatment to decrease active TB in the community. TB programs can use their local epidemiologic information to help community providers tailor their LTBI screening to their specific patient population. 
TB programs can also offer medical consultation and expert advice on the latest diagnostics and treatments for LTBI. As more patients with LTBI are treated in the community, public health can still play a vital supporting role. So let's get started on figuring out how we can work together by turning things over to Barbara Cole, who has been a terrific role model for me and is one of the hardest working people I know in TB control. Go ahead, Barbara. And Barbara, you may need to press star six to unmute your line. Uh, Barbara, if you're speaking right now, we're not able to hear you, so you may need to press star six. How about now? Perfect, loud and okay, clear, thank great. you. Good morning, well, once again. So it's exciting to know there's so many people uh, on the call today, on the webinar today, who recognize the important role we all play in addressing LTBI. So we're going to walk through uh, some of the key issues that uh, Dr. Manick highlighted uh, in her overview. All right, so we're going to move forward. This slide is intended to just reflect that TB definitely is a global issue. Multiple countries are impacted, and I know there are people from all over the U.S. on this call, so you'll see the various uh, estimated TB cases uh, from, from different countries. So we have to think globally but act locally to address specific issues in our um, respective communities. All right, moving on to the next slide. So this is a nice framework for us to think about LTBI, and you'll see the source is from Kerry Jackson, MD, but it really um, gives a nice summary about LTBI. So when we think of it, it's important that we treat it as a condition in itself, which is a precursor to serious and potentially fatal disease. In the past, we used to talk about uh, preventive treatment. Well, people truly have a latent infection. It is a TB infection, and it can lead to other potentially, a potentially fatal disease. So it has to be viewed and treated the same way as we address hypertension, uh, heart disease, renal failure, stroke, or even the basic premise that we put emphasis in car seats because of the risk of injury, and we have to take this approach if we're going to move toward TB elimination to address latent TB infection. So although we know when someone has LTBI, they're asymptomatic, we have to remember the risk, assume if we ignore um, the fact that they're infected, can be substantial. This slide is just to highlight that the active cases reported represent only the tip of the iceberg. So this is the, uh, shows you the number of cases for California in 2013. And I think each of you from your respective state could look at this and know that whatever your count is for the number of cases, and you see that for California it was 2,169 TB cases uh, below the line really represents uh, all the latent TB infection that could become active cases in the future if we do not work together to address this problem. Jeez. <laughs> it's also important to make a distinction between the risk of someone getting infected from the risk of progression to active TB once they are infected. So I'm going to make a few comments about that. So we know in terms of at risk for becoming infected would be close contacts of a person with infectious TB, persons who have immigrated within the last five years from areas of the world with high rates of TB, frequent travelers to TB endemic countries, 
and then also groups with high rates of M. tuberculosis transmission as locally we look at our epidemiological data and define it to so homeless persons, drug users, persons with HIV infection. Also at risk for infection would be persons who work or reside with people who are at high risk for TB in, in facilities or institutions. So, of course, healthcare workers in hospitals, workers in homeless shelters or residents, correctional facilities, um, residential homes for those with HIV. And sometimes we don't think about our mycobacteriology laboratory workers. They're at risk for infection if there's a breakdown in some manner uh, as they process specimens in the lab. Healthcare workers as a, a group where they're interacting with people who may have TB and yet um, the diagnosis is not yet made. And children and adolescents under 18 years of age who have one or more positive responses to the risk assessment questionnaire. And we're going to just look at a few of the types of questions that should be considered. So this is just a sample risk assessment. I will share that in California, the California TB Control Association, in conjunction with California Department of Public Health TB Control Branch, are in the process of actually developing a standard risk assessment tool that the goal will be to distribute to community partners as well, of course, health departments to use the standard form. So some of the key questions that, as providers, you would be thinking about with um, children that are in your practice is asking parents if their child was born outside of the United States. And of course, then you go on down the line, if yes, where, where, where were they born, those types of things. Uh, if they have risk factors at that point, a TST would be placed. Has the child traveled outside the United States? And again, you're looking at where they go, what they do that might result in TB infection. And then testing really should be based on the identification of, of risk on this assessment. Uh, obviously, if a child's been exposed to anyone with TB, and these questions, of course, would be adjusted for parents. This just happens to look at pediatrics. So exposure to an active case, obviously, our contacts are at risk for infection, and they would get a, a TST. You look at the timing and when you place the TST. And then close contact with the person who has a positive TB skin test. What you're looking for there is whether or not there's a recent exposure of the other person so they could have a common uh, source in terms of exposure. Some uh, additional questions that might be tailored based on the local jurisdiction so the health department knows what the epidemiologic profile are of the cases in, in each jurisdiction. So in some areas, you know, jails and prisons or shelters, illegal drug use become a big issue. And so you, look, you would, might want to add these additional questions. Um, one that sometimes we don't think about has to do with whether a child has drank raw milk or eaten <coughs> an unpasteurized cheese. And of course, this puts them at risk for Mycobacterium bovis. And of course, the TB complex, MTB complex, includes bovis. And often if we're seeing that the person's resistant to PZA or there's delayed sensitivities for PZA, it might be an indication of in bovis. So in areas where bovis is a concern, then this would be an important question to think about. Where the household member was born can be an issue. Perhaps a child was born in the U.S., but the household member travels back and forth. These are examples of the types of risk assessment questions would help guide testing so there's not just a universal testing of all children. Now, so that's at risk for infection. So when we look at risk for disease progression, meaning when they've had a latent TB infection, what factors increase the possibility of progressing to active tumors? disease. High on the list is HIV infection. So whereas most people have that 5 to 10 percent risk of going from uh, latent infection to active disease, 
within one to two years after infection. And the average population is about 10% risk over the lifetime if not treated. With HIV infection, is 10%, can be as high as 10% risk of progression per year if not treated. So very important risk factor. Injection drug use, another factor to be concerned about. Radiographic evidence of prior heal TVs, old granulomatous disease on x-ray. Low body weight, so 10% below what the ideal should be. And then, of course, there are other medical conditions such as silicosis. We know that silicosis causes inflammation uh, in the lungs and can reduce the immune system. Diabetes mm -hmm. is another immunosuppressive condition. Mm -hmm. um, Renal failure, gastrectomy, or some of the others. I'm not. I'm not saying anything. Hello. Additional uh, risk for progression to disease: head and neck cancer. Um, that's a concern in terms of impacting their ability to keep TB infection in check. In check. And then I think we see more and more of this today, where there's conditions that require prolonged use. Quarter, quarter, quarter steroids, uh, for instance, 15 milligrams of prednisone Q day for greater than three weeks, or other immunosuppressive agents such as TNF and antagonists. Um, recent converters, so again, remember there's a percent that go on to progress to active disease within the one, one to two years after infection if they're not treated. And one of the things we're learning more and more about and more and more in the research is the role of tobacco use. Um, we haven't always thought of tobacco as a risk factor for progressing from latent infection to active TB. However, there are more and more studies showing that as the smoking damages the lungs, um, there's increased risk for not only getting infected, but increased risk for progressing to disease. And in some studies, it's reflected actually uh, an increased risk of recurrent TB even after being treated. There's lots of new biologics out that are in this group of TNF antagonists like Humira, Enbrel, of course, cancer chemotherapy. These things suppress the immune system and, again, increase the risk of someone with LTBI who has not been treated, progressing to active disease. So this slide, uh, you'll see the source uh, at the bottom is modified from a CDC, and, uh, CDC information under targeted tuberculosis testing and treatment. But this just highlights, again, the, the relative risk in 1,000 person years looking at infection under a year, one to seven years duration. Um, so you have 12.9, then 1.6, but look at HIV infection, 35 to 162 um, per 100,000 person years. So it clearly spells out what a significant risk factor HIV infection is. So we know our standards should be, we should be screening our TB patients, of course, for HIV. Uh, silicosis, 68. So this just gives you a sense um, of how important these various factors are. So it's important to think about if, as we work together to try to meet this challenge of LTBI infection and how we work together in sharing uh, the care. I wanted to share this brief case study um, just to highlight how serious this can be. So there was a 40-year-old healthcare worker uh, who came from a TB endemic country, was screened as part of pre-employment, had a TST of 20 millimeters. The chest x-ray at the time showed no evidence of active disease. The positive TST was attributed to the history of BCG. And we know that's the issue we always have to discuss there's a general assumption that if someone has BCG, they will automatically test positive for, uh, on a TST test, and so sometimes no follow-up is done. Now, we know there are individuals who've had BCG 
who totally test negative on their TST. So it's not a guarantee that they're positive. We also know that it's really uh, difficult to distinguish a positive TST reaction that's due from, to BCG versus is the person actually infected. We know the countries that administer BCG are TB endemic countries. Therefore, it's just as likely or probable that the person has truly been exposed and a positive skin test could be indicative of latent uh, TB or TB infection. So, you know, the recommendation is you note the history, but follow-up is done like you would do irregardless of the BCG history. So in this instance, the healthcare worker was not offered treatment for LTBI. Again, the assumption was they tested positive because of the BCD. Turns out the healthcare worker was a nurse on a pediatric unit. One year later, after the pre-employment screening, 20 millimeter TST, normal chest, um, this patient was, a uh, healthcare worker was started on Humira for a skin disorder. On the annual TB screening, at this point, the individual had complaints of productive clots, a 10-pound weight loss. Chest x-ray was done, and it showed a right upper lobe infiltrate. So further TB workup was initiated. Of course, you know, the speed of the physical exam, all the things you need to do as part of a TB workup. And the healthcare worker turned out to be smear and culture positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis. So of course, as a result, uh, contact investigation had to be initiated. Uh, we had children exposed, other healthcare workers exposed. This is just a summary of the findings. So there were 96, 100 contacts identified as potentially exposed. 96 were tested. 86 had negative TSTs. 10 were positive. No active disease on the x-ray. Seven agreed to start treatment for LTBI with isoniazid. The patient was pan-sensitive, so INH could be used, and four were lost to follow-up. So what this case study is trying to highlight is that it is challenging addressing LTBI. As healthcare providers, it's important that we don't discount a TST that's positive in people who are BCG vaccinated. Certainly another option that can be considered, and options will be talked about, but in this context, another option that could be considered would be on BCG vaccinated uh, individuals, particularly healthcare workers. Another option would be IGRA, since it does not cross-react with BCG. The other is, as I stated, you note the BCG, you disregard it, you offer treatment of latent infection if they meet the criteria for testing. Um, this, in all probability, was a preventable exposure. Thus, the challenge was not met. So when we think about sharing the care, one of the issues that does uh, often come up is the evaluation of contacts. So this identification or identifying and evaluating individuals exposed to TB is an important TB control strategy because we're trying to break the chain of transmission. The case is already infected, so of course you're going to get them on treatment, you're going to isolate them or public health will isolate them until they're no longer infectious. Hopefully we can make a difference in preventing uh, secondary and potentially tertiary cases by doing contact investigations. So we want to identify who are the high-risk contacts. The highest priority contacts are those with the highest risk of recent infection and or high risk for progression to TB disease or increased morbidity or mortality, mortality from TB disease. So we know, you know, babies, for instance, we know HIV individuals are high risk. 
So as we look at prioritizing, and, and Louisa mentioned resources, you know, as you look at prioritizing reduce resources, you really want to be strategic at looking at who we're evaluating. Now, someone that has been exposed to a confirmed or suspect case of pulmonary laryngeal or pleural TB, uh, specifically if they have, or especially if they have cavitary lesions on their radiographs uh, and or positive AFB uh, sputum smear, and it could also, of course, be a bronchial alveolar lavage, um, that person potentially is more highly infectious than someone that's smear negative. Now, before I go on to, uh, to medium risk contacts, one thing to note, smear positive certainly uh, more infectious, but it's important to note that just because someone is smear negative, it does not rule out the possibility of disease transmission. So as you're prioritizing evaluation of contacts, that has to be kept in mind. So for medium risk contacts, um, the exposure duration and intensity, you know, the health department assists, that's where we work together in assessing who needs to be done, what's the level of risk to confirm a suspected case of pulmonary laryngeal or pleural TB, uh, cavitary lesion on chest x-ray, and or positive as AFB smear. So there's less uh, degree of exposure or contact. Now, exposure to a confirmed or suspected case of, of, of the three again, uh, negative AFB smears, abnormal chest x-ray, consistent with TB disease, but without a cavitary lesion. So they might just have bilateral, uh, bilateral infiltrates without a cavity. Again, you can't assume uh, they could not transmit disease. It's just the risk is lower than those smear positive cavitary disease. And then low priority contacts, uh, any contact to a confirmed or suspected case, pulmonary laryngeal or pleural TB that's not classified as high or medium. Uh, and there's limited exposure. So again, prioritization is very important. That's a, something we can, we can do together as public health and the uh, medical provider really looking at the total picture of who's been exposed, um, what are the factors of the index patient that increases the risk of transmission. Now, management of contacts. Now, here's an area that sometimes, you know, we really need to just remind individuals that when we're talking about contacts, we're not use, using 10 millimeters or more in duration as indicative of infection. For contacts, it's five millimeters or more of in duration, of course, not erythema, is indicative of infection, and they would need a chest x-ray and should be offered treatment for LTBI. If the TST or IGRA, or such as Quantifera and T-spot, and that's going to be discussed more later, if that's negative, you would want to evaluate the individual for window prophylaxis. By window prophylaxis, this means we're providing treatment in essence, for LTBI to, for, to high-risk contacts with an initial negative TB test and an X-ray um, pending the 8 to 10 week repeat test. So we know that the window period, we know that the window period can range anywhere between uh, two two to 10 weeks after exposure until someone might show a reaction to a TB test. So the standard is if their baseline is negative, their close contacts to the case, then you would want to start the window prophy. And then after eight to 10 weeks after the last day of exposure, the TB test would be repeated. If the repeat TB test is negative and there's no longer um, no ongoing exposure, which means the case is either now converted, they're smears, they're in treatment, they're no longer considered infectious, or the contact is broken, the person's not in the home uh, anymore, then the medication can be stopped. If the repeat TB test is positive, however, you're going to treat that individual as a TB2, latent TB infection converter, and remembering that 
recent conversion is a risk factor for progression from LTBI to active TB. Now, the questions often asked about, well, whose responsibility is it to make sure contacts are evaluated? So I just wanted to share, this is California law. For other states on the call, you would want to know what your specific law uh, states around evaluation of contacts. So you'll see for California Health and Safety Code, 121363 examination of household contacts really charges the healthcare provider who's treating a person for active tuberculosis disease to examine or cause to be examined household contacts or shall refer them to the local health officer for examination. So here's another area where we are, quote, sharing the care. Then each healthcare provider shall notify the local health officer of the referral. So if you just, as a private provider, if you just say to the patient, go see the health department, they may not come, and if we don't know about the exposure, then of course there's no way for us to follow up as public health. Now when required by the local health officer, non-household contacts and household contacts not examined by the healthcare provider can be required to submit to an examination. Uh, by the local health officer or designee, so a health department clinic. Again, for those of you from other states, you want to know specifically what your law states about contacts. Now, this, no matter who's doing the testing, whether it's the private provider, uh, community health center, the local health department does maintain oversight responsibility to ensure that contacts are evaluated. Now, sometimes there are challenges that occur because the family members of the index patient that may be your patient may not have medical insurance or are not covered. And this is an area where collaboration between the private sector and public health is essential as a greater number of at-risk individuals will be seeking care through primary care physicians as a result of the expanded medical coverage through the uh, ACA Affordable Care Act. So we want to think where are we headed in terms of addressing LTBI. So we're seeing in California, and again, think about your state, that there's a shifting paradigm for TB testing. So I wanted to share this, even though it's California Pacific, it can be food for thought about you know, looking at the science behind what we do as the global TB control. So we're looking at changing TB control protocols, look at the current science so that things are evidence, we're doing evidence-based practice. So one example is from the California TB Control Association, developed a position statement on universal TB testing of school-aged children. And so from all the review of the literature looking at public health and medical evidence, really did suggest that universal TB testing is neither necessary nor cost effective. And of course, um, AAP, there's lots of different scientific bodies, medical bodies that take the stance. And yet we still see a lot of, of students um, getting tested. So the number of pediatric cases uh, is decreasing. It's been low. And with universal testing, you can end up with a number of false positives. So this slide is just to show you uh, the number of TB cases 5 to 17 years old by place of birth uh, for California over this time frame. Again, it's California specific, but think about in your state, whichever state you're from, what is, does the epidemiological data show you in terms of cases in uh, children? And it is decreasing, which is a good thing. So here's the CDC, CTCA recommendations is that 
universal TB testing of school-age children be replaced with a TB risk assessment? I had mentioned earlier that a standard tool is being developed. Testing then would be conducted based on the results of the TB risk assessment. And you always want to consult with your local TB control program. Um, these are some general recommendations, and again, this is in California. So do discuss it with the local TB control program. Now the other change that's taking place is looking at the mandatory testing of school employees and volunteers. So the recommendation was to replace the mandated tuberculosis T, uh, examination of school employees. This is in the Health and Safety Code and Education Code for California. That again, uh, on initial employment, it would be replaced with the TB risk assessment, and TB testing would be based on the results of that risk assessment. And then the same for volunteers, that the mandatory testing would be replaced with a risk assessment questionnaire, and that would be administered as a TB risk assessment, administered on initial volunteer assignment, and testing only if there were risk factors identified on that assessment. So at the time this presentation was prepared, AB 1667 was pending. But um, last Friday, the governor actually signed AB 1667. We'll make the changes in the Health and Safety Code and Education Code. For those of you providers in California, it's not implemented yet. It's just making you aware that that's a change in the paradigm, uh, that there would be the risk assessment. They could come to the provider for that risk assessment. That risk assessment, it could be done by the school nurse. It has to be a healthcare professional. So this is going to be important. Watch for the uh, information uh, as the implementation takes place. Again, always stressing though, important to check with your local TB control program. It's also important to recognize that a school district, the board for a school district, could elect to still require TB clearance for students to enter school. So the law doesn't say they can't, it just says it's not mandatory to do the testing. And I'm sure each jurisdiction will get information out to their respective areas of the counties and cities in California about how this new law is going to be implemented. In summary, the number of reported TB cases represents only the tip of the iceberg so that we know as TB control programs, as private providers, that if we do not address the issue of a latent TB infection, we will not move towards TB elimination. So one of the strategies that we must follow is identifying and treating at-risk individuals with LTBI to, to move us toward TB elimination. And we had the Institute of Medicine report some years ago uh, talking about ending the era of neglect. And we don't want to repeat that cycle. We really want to work together, sharing the care to address individuals at risk for infection, for LTBI, and then those who are infected who are at risk for progression to active disease. So collaboration between the private and public sector is essential as we share the responsibility for care for individuals in our community. Thank you very much. I'm now going to shift. Uh, closing slide was just to remind you how we all need to work together and how many people, um, you know, look at this. Every year, 9 million people get sick with TB. We're working together to reach the 3 million. This is worldwide. Um, Three million don't get the care they need, and we need your help as providers in the community to reach them. And we always want to think about World TB Day and advocacy. Thank you very much. Shifting it now.
Hi, this is Neha Shah. I'm one of the medical officers at the TB control branch at the California Department of Health. Um, I'm going to be going over first a review of TB diagnostic tests, and then I'm going to go over TB infection treatment options. Among those, I'm going to briefly talk about the pivotal trial that introduced the short course regimen. I'll discuss the results of a larger national implementation project looking at how that regimen is working in a programmatic setting. And then I'll share experiences from California. And lastly, I'm going to end with just some innovative ways to provide DOT, which has been one of the barriers for using this new short course regimen. Let's start our, first start with testing. There are two diagnostic tests that we have available to us the tuberculin skin test, or otherwise known as the TST, and the interferon gamma release assay is also called IGRAS. The IGRAS are blood tests that measure the release of interferon gamma following stimulation by unique TB antigens. But keep in mind, both the TST and the IGRAS are surrogate markers for TB infection, and they can't distinguish between TB infection and active TB disease. So you'll always need to use your clinical your clinical parameters, including a chest x-ray, symptom review, sputum, to make your final diagnosis. This is just a simple schematic of how both the TST and the IGRAS work. With the skin test, uh, as many of you know, unique TB antigens are injected under the skin very superficially. Interferon gamma is then released by T cells, and in response to those antigens and the release of interferon gamma, you have a bump or bleb that is made on the skin that appears. And that is, is what is usually measured. Hi, okay. So I guess Mr. Munoz died. Oh, um, if anybody, Barbara, um, if you could please mute your phone line. Thank you. Sorry, Dr. Shaw. The IGRAs work in a similar way, except that the amount of interferon gamma that is released is measured in the test tube, and it is a quantitative number. How good are these IGRA tests? Well, this chart shows the sensitivity estimates of the quantiferon and T-spot in low- and middle-income countries that, are, that have been obtained from individual studies and pooled estimates. The sensitivity of the quantiferon is approximately 84% and the T-spot approximately 88%. What about the specificity? The specificity of the TST among individuals who have received the BCG vaccine is about 59%. Barbara mentioned that in her example, the patient had had BCG vaccination. That does, the TST and the BCG do interact, so it makes the specificity of the TST a little bit lower. For patients without BCG, though, the specificity of the TST goes up to 97%. However, the quantiferon or the IGRAS specificity is independent of BCG and is about 96%. This is why the IGRA is usually preferred for patients with BCG vaccination. They also have the added advantage of not needing for a return visit. They're not affected by most other non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And the interpretation of the IGRAS is quantitative, so it's not up to um, tester interpretation. Some time ago, labs started reporting the quantitative results of the quantiferon test. You may have seen some of these as they've been recently coming out, so it might be helpful to be familiar with how to interpret these results. I'm going to walk you through what these results generally look like. On your screen, you see what usually these results look like when you get them. What you're most interested in is this last line here. If that number is greater than 0.35, then the result is positive. In this case, the result was 7.03, and that is positive. If it is less than 0.35, then your result is negative. Regardless of what test you choose, again, keep in mind that 90% of all confirmed TB cases have a negative skin test, and 39% of all HIV-positive individuals have a negative skin test. So, neither, so a, neither a negative IGRA or TST rules out that you have TB. You always need to use your clinical, your clinical judgment as well. Let's move on to treatment. 
there's going to be a polling question here that comes up. Which of these regimens have you used to treat TB infection or latent TB infection? It looks like the majority of you have been using INH, but a good number of you have been using the four months of rifampin. And so we're going to talk about these regimens. There are four main options for the treatment of TB infection. Um, as many of you responded, you're, you're fairly familiar with them. Nine months of INH, daily INH and rifampin for three to four months, daily rifampin for four months, and then the once weekly INH and rifapentine for three months. And I'm going to go over these in a little bit more detail. First, the mainstay of TB infection treatment has been INH for nine months since the 1960s. It's effective and it reduces the risk of TB by up to 90%. However, adherence rates have been poor with completion rates in programmatic settings about 50%. And the, and INH, and the incidence of side effects can be high. However, people who are HIV positive and on ARTs can use INH. Another option that many of you are using is rifampin given daily for four months. So this regimen has been a recommendation for quite some time. One of the reasons is not become the gold standard is because we are lacking some efficacy data on it. Currently there is an ongoing study looking at four months of rifampin versus nine months of INH, but a recent network meta-analysis does suggest that four months of rifampin is as efficacious but compared to placebo. There are data showing that there have been better completion rates and lower rates of hepatotoxicity with the four months of rifampin compared to the nine months of INH. Again, similar to rifampin for four months, the combination of rifampin and INH has limited data. The limited data, though, does suggest that the efficacy is likely the same as either six or nine months of INH. However, there are, there is likely a higher rate of side effects. The newest regimen is a combination of INH and rifapentine, and I'm going to review very quickly the study that looked at this regimen in more detail. The, the combination therapy was compared to INH. Both arms had the same number of patients. The combination therapy was given using directly observed therapy weekly for 12 weeks, whereas the INH was given by self-administered therapy daily for nine months. The results showed that the new regimen was as effective as nine months of INH, but the completion rates were higher and the rates of hepatotoxicity were lower. So these were very fairly positive results and significantly could reduce the time for treatment of latent TB infection. The big question though after the study came out was whether there would be similar results outside of a clinical setting. Specifically, there were concerns about safety and adverse events given the high dose of INH and the previous experience, as some of you might remember, with the combination of rifampin and PZA, which ended up leading to higher rates of death. So to try to get a, a handle on how this would work programmatically and to, and to monitor side effects, the CDC decided that they should spearhead a national implementation project. The purpose of the project was to assess in a programmatic setting the feasibility, acceptability, effectiveness, and tolerability of this new regimen. More importantly, we wanted to monitor if there were any serious adverse events happening early in case we needed to change guideline recommendations. There are 22 sites, 21 sites plus the Bureau of Prisons that are participating across the U.S. representing different target populations and settings. These sites all volunteer to participate. We have three sites in California, Sacramento, Santa Clara Corrections, and University of California in San Diego. The sites were systematically supposed to collect data on the use of this regimen, including side effects, and any case management issues for two years, from July 2011 through December of 2013. All sites provided the medication using some form of DOT, and I'm going to discuss that a little bit later in this presentation. But the DOT could be video, phone, in person. There could be different ways of doing the DOT. And importantly, there was no additional funding provided for this study. 
sites could use, choose to use the CDC created monitoring forms. So CDC created standardized monitoring forms and a database that sites could use to track their LTBI patients. <coughs> um, all sites were asked to collect the following information. You'll see here with every DOT dose given, there is a review of symptoms on side effects. That was completed at each individual dose given. And then a final disposition for each patient. <coughs> if a side effect was reported, an adverse event form was completed. This form documents when a side effect was experienced. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me, my throat's a little dry. <coughs> so this form documented when a side effect was experienced in relation to when the medication was taken and, <coughs> and the outcome of that side effect. What have we learned to date? Well, these results are as, as of October 2013. There have been about 2,100 people who started on the regimen. Of the 2,000 who were eligible to complete therapy, we have seen an 85% completion rate. <coughs> Among those who received one dose of the medication, 34% reported at least one side effect. The most common, commonly reported side effect was nausea and vomiting followed by fatigue. There, at, at the time that these slides were made, there were 17 severe adverse events defined as any patient who was hospitalized or died while on therapy. Of the 17, six have been further investigated by the CDC, and there have been no deaths or permanent sequelae noted to date from these 17 hospitalizations. I know many of you are not in California, but I wanted to share the experiences we've been having here in California from the sites that participated. Generally speaking, as of a few months ago, we have had about 21 jurisdictions using this regimen in some way or another. We have 61 jurisdictions here in California. 38% are using it in their health department clinics, which could be TB clinics, refugee clinics, or primary care. Several reported that community providers were using this regimen, and a good number say that both their health departments and their community providers are using the regimen. So we're beginning to see good uptake of this regimen. Let's look specifically at the sites participating in the national project. So I mentioned we had three sites, Sacramento, Santa Clara, and UCSD. Sacramento probably has the most experience with this regimen so far. They are administering this medication using in-clinic uh, DOT or less frequently going into the field to provide DOT. They're doing monthly monitoring of labs. And at the time that we abstracted the data, they had 95 patients that had started the regimen with an 80% completion rate. I believe they're somewhere now have had about 200 patients who have taken, who have taken this regimen. The most common side effects noted were malaise, gastric discomfort, headache, and then some puritis, usually about one to two hours after taking their dose. Most of them were be able to be medically managed, and only one discontinued the medication so far due to elevated liver enzymes, which normalized after the medication had been stopped. The University of California in San Diego is using this regimen for their, for their students. UCSD has been a leader in pioneering alternative DOT strategies, including video and wireless DOT, and they offered their students an alternative method for providing DOT, including video, phone, or email DOT. The results so far were that they had 37 page students who started therapy and a 92% completion rate. Of those that completed therapy, the most commonly reported side effect, again, was nausea followed by malaise. One person experienced a flu-like symptom that was thought to be unrelated to the medication, but stopped the medication anyway. Lastly, Santa Clara Jail also implemented this regimen. DOT in the jail system is provided for all the medications, so there wasn't a change in their protocol for how DOT was provided. 
They did perform baseline and monthly liver function tests. They had 91 patients start, start therapy with an 85% completion rate. Of those who had at least one dose of medication, 18% reported a side effect, and the most common side effect was fever or chills. There were two people who discontinued due to side effects. But again, overall, we have not had any serious adverse events or reported deaths in California. Lastly, I just briefly wanted to touch on the subject of directly observed therapy. <clears throat> this has been kind of a big barrier for providing this new short course regimen, and I wanted to go over some advances and creative ways that you can provide DOT. One thing that I mentioned was video DOT. This was started in UCSD, and what it does is that the patient records themselves taking the medication, it's time stamped and then sent to the TB program. <coughs> Wireless DOT is just coming online. <coughs> How this works is that the medication is put into an ingestible sensor-enabled capsule that the patient swallows. After the patient swallows it, it's a, it sends a signal to a box that the patient is wearing, and that signal is then uploaded into the computer and sent to the TB program. <coughs> study 33 is I adhere. It's the follow-up to the original, the original study looking at the short course and looks at different ways of providing the medication. There are three arms, the standard directly observed therapy. There <coughs> is self-administered therapy, and then modified self-administered therapy, which includes text messaging as a reminder to take your medication. And then patients bring in their bottles until they're counted. In, um, in one of our jurisdictions here in California, we are piloting DOT with pharmacists at a Safeway-based pharmacy. Patients would go into the pharmacist, get their medication from the pharmacist, and the pharmacist would, would do the DOT and the review of symptoms. Finally, you can use your other community resources. One of our jurisdictions here works with their EMT service to provide DOT. They're using this for their active TB patients, but you can certainly consider working with them to provide it for your TB infection cases. You can also work with your methadone clinics they provide medications to their patients daily, and it's one of the options we've looked at in one of our jurisdictions here to provide the short course regimen. And finally, um, one of our other jurisdictions here is working with their homeless clinics and shelters to provide medication in their homeless, in their homeless clinics or mobile vans. In summary, uh, IRAs are a good diagnostic tool, but there are limitations that you need to be aware of. The short course therapy for TB infection is being implemented nationally, and we've had really good results in California, so it should be a regimen that you should consider and not let DOT stand in your way of not being able to provide short course therapy. And remember that also TB elimination is, is impossible if we don't treat TB infection. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much to Dr. Shaw, Barbara Cole, and Dr. McNick. At this time, we are going to move into the uh, question and answer. So I've updated the screen here, and on the bottom, you should see an area where you can type in your question and click submit. And to begin with, we're going to take the phone questions. Um, if we don't get time to address all of the text questions that get submitted, then some of those may be um, addressed after the training is over uh, by posting an FAQ on the website along with the archived recording of today's training. So let me pause for a moment and uh, we'll take any phone questions. So most of the phone lines have been placed on mute. You'll need to press star six to unmute yourself and ask your question. This is Dr. Ellie. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. So um, one of the uh, problems that we have now is that uh, with uh, older people with BCG, we do uh, IGRA testing. 
um, since that eliminates about one third of the false positives. But with children under five, um, we do uh, tuberculin testing, uh, TST. And what do we do when we have a child who's foreign born with BCG who has a positive uh, TST um, but a normal x-ray? Um, since uh, we don't usually do um, IGRAs, and IGRAs are felt to be unreliable below the age of five. Barbara, do you want me to answer that, or did you want to speak to that? Well, I'll, I'll speak partially, and then you can add to it. Can you hear me? Yes. Am I yes. on mute? We can hear you, Barbara. Thank you. All right. Sorry. So, yes, so for children under five, absolutely, the recommendation is still to do a TST. But you also want to think about why are you testing the child, number one. You know, what's, what's the risk for testing? But if the test is administered, it tests positive, um, and the chest x-ray is clear, our standard is to go ahead and offer treatment for LTBI infection, even though it could be linked uh, to the BCG. The fact remains it's administered, BCG is usually administered in TB endemic countries. And they have, do you want to add to that? No, I think that's right. Um, and you know, CDC guidelines still say to ignore the BCG and just go with their, the results that you see. And it, if you do a TST and an IGRA, they do say that if either are positive, you should go with that result. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I see we have a number of uh, questions coming in via text and in the chat window as well. If you could please direct those questions to the Q&A uh, box. That would be our preference. And let me see if there's another phone question before we move on to the text question. Okay. Well, thank you. Let's go through some. Well, of the I have questions. another question. I have oh, another please, question. Go ahead. The uh, I wonder if you're going to change your guideline. You mentioned that uh, after five years, uh, you uh, after a. Um, patient is more than five years in the country, you consider them a lower risk for, uh, for tuberculosis. But the recent California study in Filipinos showed that uh, the risk at uh, two years and 10 years was the same for reactivation. And I wonder if you're going to change that, uh, that one slide that uh, mentioned high risk for the first five years. Okay. So who is that directed to? Well, actually, I think I think it was Louise uh, that uh, I think it was first. All right. First so, slide. Louise, you, Louise, you want to take that? Uh, well, well, Dr. McNeil, I don't think presented slides. She gave some introductory. So that must be. Right. It must have been Barbara Cole then. All right. So I'm Barbara. So in terms of changing protocols, not at this time. Uh, we still consider the time frame specify as the highest risk. Whether there's enough. Uh, local studies to, to say 10 years out we should be reassessing. I think that comes down to some of the local uh, epidemiological data and it would be best to discuss with the local, the health department in your jurisdiction because they will set the local standards. Thank you. All right, thank you. Are there any other phone questions? And as a reminder, if, if you may need to press star six to unmute your phone line to be able for us to hear you ask the question. Okay, I think we will move to the text questions. And I see uh, there's a number that have come in. Several of them are specific to the DOT, video DOT, whether Skype is used, and asking Dr. Shaw to elaborate on the DOT where the patient has a, a swallowed sensor. So, Dr. Sure. Shaw? Yeah, this is also research that is ongoing uh, in San Diego as well. And it's um, fairly new technology, although in the HIV world they've been looking at many different ways to monitor adherence. The electronic um, DOT is uh, how it works is that the medications are put into, a, into a, another capsule the capsule is swallowed, and as it makes its way through, it sends out a signal to a monitoring box that the patient is wearing. That box then sends wirelessly the information that the patient swallowed that medication to a computer 
that transmits it to the TB control program so they can monitor that their patient has actually taken the medication for that day. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, let's see. There's a variety of other questions here. Uh, one of them is related to um, screening that may be needed when, uh, what labs do you do during the 12-week DOT if there are no side effects? The way that the CDC recommendations came out is that you don't need to do any additional labs than what you would do for anyone else who you treat with latent TB infection. So you usually would get liver function enzymes on patients who you are concerned have an elevated baseline risk of having some liver function problems. Um, each program, when they implemented the 3-HP regimen, chose to implement it in whichever programmatic way they chose to. Some programs started with baseline labs and then didn't repeat them unless there was a reason. Some did them monthly. Um, it just very much depends on the programmatic comfortability with that regimen. Some programs started doing it more frequently, and then as they got more comfortable with the regimen, stopped doing them as frequently. But the guidelines don't recommend that you have to do them in any routine way. Uh, this is, is Barbara. I will add one other thing in terms of monitoring, though. We found some patients and we used, uh, we were doing high school students had some uh, hypotension. So thinking about monitoring their blood pressure is something you, you want to give some thought to. Thank you. Um, there's another text question here coming in. Um, when referring to TB endemic countries relative to the foreign-born patients, which countries are these specifically? How would we find out that information? Go ahead, Lisa. So TB is endemic basically everywhere in the world except for um, the U.S., Canada, Western Europe, Australia, and I think Japan is not considered very high risk, but pretty much everywhere else, certainly Africa, Eastern Europe, um, Asia, those would all be considered TB endemic countries. Okay, and I believe that their, that information will also be available on the CDC website. I believe they have a map as well. Thank you. I, I believe I heard someone ask what about Mexico in the background. Yeah. South yeah, America. So Yes. Great. Are there any additional phone questions? Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, here's a question. When someone has a positive TSP and negative QFT, how often do you recommend retesting? And I'll mention there's a variety of TST, QFT, questions we've seen. Well, I'll let Barbara kind of give the more detailed summary, but I, that also will depend on if there are any reason to be retesting that patient to begin with. Um, and that's where the risk assessment will come back, will come into play. Yes, correct. Also, routinely, you're, you want to pick one test and stick with it <laughs> versus, you know, back and forth. So if you believe that TST is the way to go, then we would not be confirming or retesting a person with an IGRA. Uh, if it ends up with one, whichever one is positive, you, you're obligated to consider that that person could be infected to follow occur accordingly. So I think the key is to decide which test you're going to use. Think about BCG vaccinated individuals, that IGRA may be the way to go, except for children under five. That way you don't have that dilemma of which test to believe. Um, this is Louise. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with Barbara. Um, try and pick one or the other and try not to do both because um, it does, it can make things very confusing. But I do do a lot of um, immigrant screening and some of the people will come in with a positive skin test, um, including children. And in those situations, if there's no known TB exposure, um, I will do a quantiferon. If it's negative, even in children under five, I will not uh, treat for LTBI. And I think that that's, I think I'm not alone in, in using that uh, 
procedure. Thank you. Okay, there are a lot of questions coming in. Um, a lot of them are very specific relative to TST and IGRAs, and I, I think we've spoken to that a little bit and um, can probably give some summary comments on the FAQ document that we'll post with the recording. Uh, one, one participant's asking, why aren't IGRAs recommended for children under five? There just isn't a lot of data looking. There is now becoming more data looking at the sensitivity and specificity of IGRAs for children under five. Um, it's just that those recommendations and there's discussion of updating the recommendations, but at the time that the CDC recommendations were written, there were very limited data on IGRAs for children under five. <clears throat> Thank you. And another question, do you have to discontinue statins when a patient is on INA? There is no general guideline that you need to discontinue any of the medications, even if they are potentially liver toxic when you start somebody on, on latent TB therapy. You may be more concerned and you may want to monitor their LFTs the first few doses more so than in another patient, but um, you don't need to stop their medication. Thank you. Okay, here's a question about, uh, please explain the screening question about raw milk or eating <coughs> unpasteurized cheeses. Okay, this is Barbara. So with raw milk or unpasteurized cheeses that can contain in bovis, uh, bovine TB, and if children are ingesting that, it's possible for them to have disease that's due to in bovis and it presents similarly to MTB. Um, we had uh, an infant with TB meningitis that turned out had had raw milk and um, bovis was identified. So it's a screening question based on where you are in terms of the risk of bovine TB in your area. And certainly bovis can be managed, but um, it's a preventive measures in terms of educating parents about the risk. Thank you. And this is Kelly. I'll also add that the Curry Center is offering a webinar on MBOVIS, and that's going to take place on November 7th, and that registration is now open. So you can find that on our website on the 2014 training calendar. So I think we have time for maybe one final question. And then we'll wrap up this training. I'll pause to see if there's any final questions via the phone. And again, star six is what you would need to press to unmute yourself. OK, well, let's see. There's one question regarding billing and DOT that I see here. Um, how is? Sorry, it's just moved down the screen as another <laughs> series of questions how came in. Right, d essentially how is billing handled when there's methadone clinics, homeless yeah. shelters, and a variety of individuals doing DOT? So you can bill for DOT. Um, if you are, for example, the methadone clinic or the homeless clinic, they can bill themselves. They can bill Medi-Cal themselves for the DOT. If you're doing it in another type of facility, um, frequently I would speak to your local TB program because many of them have agreements or contracts with some of their community providers that set up ways for them to bill, but there are ways to bill for DOT um, if you have an agreement of services between the, between the institutions. Might I just add, though, if someone's not eligible for Medi-Cal, um, because that's usually the payment source. You really have to think about how you collaborate, perhaps, with public health, um, where medicines potentially could be provided and the facility administers them, because not every patient has a third-party payer. Right, that's an important point. Thank you, Barbara. OK, well, that will conclude our training today. So thank you all very much for joining. Thank you for your time. And please do remember to complete your online evaluation within one week. And as I mentioned, that evaluation link has been emailed to each participant this morning, everyone who registered, I should say. If there are any group members who perhaps weren't able to register but are listening in, um, there 
is an opportunity to enter your email address and your full name. I'll put that up um, at the end of the training. And you can also send in um, an email in order to receive this evaluation link because that's unique for each email address and it cannot be shared. Feel free to contact us at the Curry Center if you have any questions or concerns. Uh, thanks again for your participation. And as I also mentioned earlier, this training has been recorded. The archived recording will be posted on the Curry Center website in about one week's time, along with the FAQ document that will address any questions that we didn't speak to this morning. So thank you, and this concludes the training. <laughs>